WrestleMania, the showcase of the immortals. Every year, wrestling fans, whether die hard, casual, or lapsing, look forward to the show of shows. It's where legends are made, milestones are reached, and moments are created. It's also fair to say that WrestleMania is, for all intents and purposes, the fairest annual snapshot of WWE. To look at any given Mania card is to be reminded of what WWE's composition was in any given year. Usually, that's a good thing, but not always. Take the case of the show we're about to examine here today. It's a story of a WrestleMania with plenty of ills, some out of WWE's hands and others self-inflicted. It's a tale of how deep an injury bug can burrow beneath the flesh. And it's also a prime example of how desperation and ham-handedness can make a five-hour pay-per-view card feel especially torturous. A record crowd witness arguably the biggest misfire of WWE's reality era. WrestleMania 32 is one of the worst shows ever. It's safe to say that there were very ambitious plans for WrestleMania 32. Seeing as WWE had booked the monstrous AT&T Stadium in suburban Dallas as Mania's venue. As the only American stadium capable of holding the grand delusions of Cowboys owner Jerry Jones, the favorite owner for the fans of the other 31 NFL teams, AT&T Stadium is capable of holding over 100,000 patrons when the field is also set up for seating. Clearly, WWE was aiming to break their own personal all-time attendance record, which was previously set by WrestleMania in 1987, when more than 93,000 spectators witnessed Hulk Hogan body slam Andre the Giant at the Pontiac Silverdome, brother. But not actually, you see, I, I counted the crowd myself and it's actually only 78,000 fans. Oh, the arrogance of youth. Yes, it's disputed what the actual attendance for WrestleMania 3 is, but on the higher end, WWE claims that it's over 93,000. Seeing as the AT&T Stadium can accommodate more than 93,000 fans, there's no doubt that WWE was looking to trumpet a new record-breaking number, likely a six-figure head count. To fill a stadium that big, one would assume WWE would need to put together the best possible card, but let's be honest, the WrestleMania name sells itself. Now it's true, Linda McMahon could win the Women's Rumble, Nia Jax could hold one of the women's titles, and if WWE announced that they were headlining night two of WrestleMania, there would be thousands of fans just grumbling about dropping four figures on front row seats and a hotel room. And not only that, they'd actually have to sit through it, but they'd still do it. But I digress, there are always high expectations for WrestleMania, and this was especially true in 2016. The previous two Manias went down in history among the best in the event's chronology, particularly as they both delivered tremendously satisfying conclusions. Those two endings, of course, share a common theme. They were facilitated by the will of an angry mob. In 2014, WWE intended to end WrestleMania with an ice-cold Randy Orton defending the unified title against a randomly returning 45-year-old Batista. This would leave Red Hot Daniel Bryan stuck in the mid-card. And fans were not going to let that stand. After many weeks of crowds screaming their disapproval, WWE caved, modifying Mania plans to put Bryan over via a two-match parlay. A year later, audience anger kicked up once more when then babyface Roman Reigns, at the height of his suffering succotash son phase, was set up to conquer the resident conqueror Brock Lesnar at WrestleMania 31. And fans couldn't have been more bemused. Even John Cena was like, yeah, they, they really hate this guy. In the 11th hour, WWE called an audible and had Seth Rollins crash the party with his lovely shiny briefcase, capturing the title to the joy of all. Well, I say all, aside from Roman's father, Sika, who reportedly went berserk on WWE management afterwards. Point being, spurred by forever and outrage of the audience, WWE had a recent history of getting cold feet when it came to executing Plan A. With WWE planning to crown the still polarizing reigns a year later, would lightning strike a third time? The short answer is no. The long answer is no. No. Get the idea. A year later, Reigns still wasn't accepted by most of the ticket buying populace. Sure, there was a period in the autumn where they were kind of happy to see Reigns pick up some big wins, mostly because the crowd seemed to hate Sheamus more, but that feeling dissipated quickly. By January's Royal Rumble, Reigns was back to where he was a year earlier, a hollow representation of what WWE wants their main baby faces to be. And it's not Roman's fault. Clearly, from 2020 onwards, Reigns has proven that he is unquestionably a top guy, a once in a generation talent talent worthy of residing in WWE's pantheon. But by playing this one-note action hero that read from hammy, crappy scripts, 
he wasn't going to make it via this path. Still, WWE had a plan to put Reigns over in grand fashion at WrestleMania 32, and no amount of public dissent was going to change that. I'll say this much though, as far as WrestleMania went, at least Reigns made it to the card. The same couldn't be said for a lot of valuable WWE stars. A number of featured players would end up missing WrestleMania 32 due to injuries, and many of these individuals actually played a significant part at WrestleMania 31 just a year earlier. Among the more costly was WWE Champion Seth Rollins, who blew out his knee during a European tour in November. The belt was vacated and the architect would be sidelined until the following May missing WrestleMania. But at least the savior of WrestleMania 31 seemed to have an eventual path back. WrestleMania 30 hero Daniel Bryan, meanwhile, was forced into retirement that February due to lingering concussion issues. Now, the American Dragon eventually received clearance. It wouldn't be in time to help out for this show. And it got worse. WrestleMania cornerstones John Cena and Randy Orton were also due to miss the show of shows. Cena underwent shoulder surgery at the dawn of 2016, while Orton had been out since October with a similar issue. Add Cesaro to that club after he went out in November with a torn rotator cuff. Around the same time, former Divas champion Nikki Bella was sidelined with a neck injury. The aerodynamic Neville suffered a freak ankle injury in March, putting him out for four months. The Wyatt family was also stricken with bad luck. The patriarch Bray was working through a significant back injury and was often protected in tag bouts where he didn't have to do as much. The news was worse for Luke Harper, who tore up his knee about two weeks out from WrestleMania. In all, only 11 of the 21 individuals that competed at WrestleMania 31 would wrestle at 32. Of those 11, Paige and Brie Bella were stuck on the pre-show, while R-Truth was relegated to the you get a payday too, Battle Royal. With such a sizable chunk of the roster compromised by injuries, let's see if WWE can pull an ace from up their sleeve. The WWE title match was just another transparent attempt to make Reigns the face of the WWE as the big dog would challenge new WWE champion Triple H for the gold. Over the previous two and a half years, quite a few baby faces had got their biggest pops by sizing up to the evil head of the authority. So WWE was clearly hoping for the same effect here. And what a fine start it got off to in Orlando at the Royal Rumble, when fans cheered wildly as Triple H threw Reigns out of the match. Well, in fairness, Orlando does love Daddy Rising. You know, he does the whole point, point of the indie guy. You know, he, he does the point. And one indie darling that a lot of WWE fans liked was John Moxley, who'd spent the last five years as Dean Ambrose. Whether the most poetically unhinged member of the Shield or the nonchalantly goofy guy with a tattered wardrobe, Ambrose connected with the WWE audiences on a level that reigns for all of his talents just hadn't yet. In fact, most WWE fans at the time would have preferred to see the lunatic fringe as the one standing tall at the end of WrestleMania 32. But instead, Ambrose would go one on one with the beast incarnate himself, Brock Lesnar. That was my best Paul Heyman. Let me know in the comments if it was good. And it would be an anything goes match. Now that sounds pretty cool, right? Two creative brutes piecing together an absolute war inside AT&T Stadium. Where do I sign up? Speaking of mayhem, the Intercontinental title would be up for grabs in the same fashion it was a year earlier, a seven-man ladder match. This time, scheming champion Kevin Owens got himself in a fine Laurel and Hardy-like mess when he was given carte blanche to choose his WrestleMania opponent. But rather than choose a pushed contender, Owens orchestrated a triple threat between underpushed mid-carders, Zack Ryder, Sin Cara, and Stardust to determine his challenger. Yes, Cody Rhodes was presented on TV explicitly as a hapless jobber. Seriously, the next time you watch WWE use Cody to his maximum potential, remind yourself that this, this was how they saw the American Nightmare in 2016. Adrenaline in his soul gets his release, that's the goal. So yeah, management pushed Owens by sticking him in a ladder match with those three apparent bottom rungers, along with three viable challengers he spurned in Dolph Ziggler, The Miz, and Sami Zayn. Sounds like a fun car crash. But WWE wasn't done gimmicking the pay-per-view yet. One special attraction came about following a surprise return. After more than six years away from WWE, Shane McMahon is back with an unexpected return on an episode of Raw in February. And he confronted his father and sister for, for, for reasons, but to hell with those reasons. The crowd reaction was nuclear. 
like goosebump inducing. The prodigal son had come home. The family acrimony led to Vince booking Shane versus Undertaker in a Hell in a Cell match, which wasn't something anybody was remotely expecting more than 10 minutes earlier, but for a WrestleMania that was going to be missing some franchise level players, Shane versus Taker inside the cell with, with control of WWE, a lockbox full of secrets, a, a year's supply of Febreze, and the recipe for WWF ice cream bars all hanging in the balance, it was a pretty nice novelty to have. And even better, the return of Shane apparently juiced ticket sales as it came wholly out of left field. Granted, we may have that to blame for six years of Shane going move for move with WWE's biggest stars while exuding enough sweat to adequately waterboard Godzilla. But these, these were somewhat desperate times. And they were also changing times, for the Divas title was coming to its end. Yes, the butterfly was being decommissioned in favor of a reborn WWE Women's Championship, and a triple threat would be held to crown the new title holder. The three entrants were all revolution call-ups, the final Divas champion Charlotte Flair, and fellow horsewomen Sasha Banks and Becky Lynch. Elsewhere, short-lived tag team Chris Jericho and AJ Styles were set for singles action on the WrestleMania cart. Fans felt that the era of Y2 AJ came to end far too early, even if it was designed for an immediate split. And why not? The recently arrived Styles had main event potential, while Jericho was content to putting over ascending stars. And speaking of ascending stars, tag champs The New Day had recently turned babyface on the strength of their charisma and amusing antics, making them the hottest act in all of WWE. For WrestleMania, they were matched up against the League of Nation members Sheamus, Rusev, and Alberto Del Rio, who were not, not the hottest act in WWE. Ah, the League of Nations. Let's take four brawny non-Americans that don't currently have any discernible character direction, stick them together as a group of snarling heels, and then use them to try and get some heat on Reigns. Now remember the old Batman TV series where the villain of the week would dispatch a gaggle of similarly dressed idiots to fight Batman and Robin and the words like blam and pow would fill the screen? Well, they all got their asses kicked to the sounds of catchy surf rock. That was the League of Nations. You know, I honestly can't remember if the word kapow appeared after Reigns belted Rusev with a Superman punch, but there's a good chance it at least happened once. Also, there would be another Andre the Giant Memorial Battle Royal in what would turn out to be a rare one for the main WrestleMania card. That's kind of how you know the roster's a bit light. For the purpose of this video, we'll gloss over the three pre-show matches, which were Kalisto defeating Ryback to retain the US title, a 10-woman tag that ended with Brie Bella tapping Naomi out to her husband's yes lock, and the Usos defeating the Dudley Boys. They were all what they were, just assorted mid-card extras. As for the actual card itself, well, how much time do you have? Because the main card was five hours long. Overall, it was a seven hour show counting the pre-show. If the show's gonna be that long, it had better be the best damn WrestleMania ever. It wasn't, this is worst shows ever you're watching. But we kick off the main card with a pretty good match, the seven way ladder scramble for the Intercontinental title. While perhaps a hair or two below the greatness of the match won by Daniel Bryan the previous year, this was still an ambitious stunt show with lots of wince inducing crashes, like when Kevin Owens was suplexed head first onto a ladder. This WrestleMania began with a heartwarming moment though, as The Miz was about to pull down the belt only for long underutilized Zack Ryder to shove him off and snare the title for himself. The fans rejoiced as Ryder celebrated the moment with his father. Then Ryder dropped the belt to The Miz the next night on Raw. Well, I guess that's why they call it a WrestleMania moment, because in a moment, you're, you're bound to lose everything. But for the time, we got a genuine babyface victory and some good vibes to kick off the biggest show of the year. But how long would those good vibes last? Well, they should definitely continue through the next match, the singles encounter between AJ Styles and Chris Jericho. The phenomenal one is clearly earmarked for a big push, while aging Jericho is the master of putting tomorrow's top guys over. And to boot, we're going to get one hell of a match out of it. So let's just enjoy what is sure to be a classic. Jericho won. That's, um, interesting. I guess on a show where so many babyfaces are going to reign victorious over WWE's evildoers, it's best to throw a swerve in there somewhere. Yeah, good for, good for Jericho, I guess. As for the match, it was pretty good, though perhaps a notch or two below the lofty expectations fans tend to have for Styles matches with wrestling gods. You know, fingers crossed Styles doesn't have any future WrestleMania matches that are a bit like that. Hi, Shinsuke Nakamura.
And for what it's worth, Styles did pin Jericho in a multi-man match the next night on Raw to become the number one contender for the world title. So, what's the point of this show again? Well, this next match is a surefire babyface win. It's the New Day with a lovable cereal box entrance as the tag team champions of the world were taking on the League of Nations, a heel group that puts the pathetic in apathetic crowd response. Time for the New Day to clown these clowns, right? And, you know, dance around ringside playing a little victory song on Xavier's trombone. Sorry, the League of Nations won. Really? Why? Like, is there an additive in Bootios that caused all three members to flunk the wellness test or something? Something is clearly not right. So, while well, that result obviously bummed out the crowd, we do get a very random appearance from Stone Cold, Shawn Michaels, and Mick Foley, who come down to the ring and run the heels off. And then Austin beats up Xavier Woods because, well, that's the bottom line, cause Stone Cold said so. Yay. Take that, modern wrestling. You'll never be as good as it was back in the day. You know, imagine WrestleMania X7. All six of the TLC participants were beaten up afterwards by Tony Atlas, Don Morocco, and the Iron Sheik. Actually, Sheik won that night, didn't he? It's, it's beside the point. Anyway, this throwaway six-man continued a very bizarre streak. Remember how The Miz beat Ryder on the next night's Raw while Styles got his win back over Jericho? Go ahead and guess what happened on the post-mania Raw. Go ahead, guess. I'll wait. If you guessed that the New Day got their win back over the League of Nations, who then proceed to kick Wade Barrett out of the group before then the group shortly dissolves thereafter, step up and collect your prize. Then prepare to lose the prize tomorrow because, you know, 50-50 booking rules. Next on the docket is Ambrose and Lesnar's super duper deadly bunkhouse brawl grindhouse bloodbath death match to end all death matches. Or so it seemed. What we got instead of that promising melee was Lesnar kicking Ambrose's ass for 85% of the match with more throwing Germans than the Dusseldorf hammer toss. According to Ambrose, Lesnar was completely apathetic about the match, as was management. While Ambrose had ambitious plans about making the match memorable, understanding full well he was probably losing, Lesnar blew off all attempts at planning the match and what we got instead was a half-ass brawl with some bog standard weapons. Mind you, Ambrose was gifted a barbed wire bat and a chainsaw by Mick Foley and Terry Funk in the run-up to the match. Perhaps Mox could have also called on another legend and asked DDP for his eternal optimism. Would have made this experience much less soul-crushing. And so Ambrose eats an F5 on some chairs, and that's all she wrote. And unlike the first three matches, there was no 50-50ing to be had on Raw. I mean, come on, Brock working a TV match? <laughs> so after the third heel win in a row, we move on to the women's title match. Charlotte versus Becky versus Sasha. Feels like this would be a good time for a pick-me-up, right? And why not Sasha? Not only is she earning rave reviews for her performances, like her Brooklyn match with Bailey the previous year, but she's being sung to the ring by her actual cousin and my best mate, Snoop Dogg. That is a genuinely real photo of the icon, the legend, the greatest of all time, and Snoop Dogg. Back to Sasha. Her attire is paying homage to her idol, Eddie Guerrero, whose home state of Texas is where this WrestleMania is taking place. Banks makes the most sense, so let's put her over. You're joking me. Charlotte wins by submitting Becky? Of course she does. Now, let's look at the positives. It was definitely the best match on the card to this point, and proof positive that the women can steal the show at WrestleMania. But damn, they really love their heel winners tonight, don't they? You know, now that I think about it, in that Royal Rumble match that Reigns won, WWE deliberately and explicitly pissed off the crowd at different points. You know, Brian going early, the lazy eliminations of Ziggler, Wyatt, and Ambrose, just to try and swing the hungry audience behind their unpopular hero of choice by making him their final hope. Doing it for one match is one thing, but over the course of a whole WrestleMania, You've got grapefruits, Vince. And speaking of Vince's grapefruits, let's see how the prodigal seed does inside Hell in a Cell. It should be said that there were theoretically criminally high stakes in this match. Shane could run raw with a win, Undertaker may be banished from WrestleMania with a loss, and Shane possesses many dire secrets about his father and is trying to blackmail him. And what of Triple H and Stephanie's power? Will they face a downgrade if Shane is able to leverage his father's vulnerability more to his own liking? You see, right there, I just put more thought into this angle than Vince apparently did over the many weeks of its alleged execution. Once Shane was back and he and his pops finished that bizarre row, the poorly written angle pretty much 
petered out and the match was all about getting people to drool over a giant steel cage. You know, that's why they based a whole pay-per-view around it. Apparently there were fans out there that go, ooh, it's cage month. And speaking of months, that's about how long this match felt. Now I'm not saying we should have expected the 51 year old Undertaker and 46 year old Sweat Stain O'Mac, who's working his first match in seven years, to have a riveting fight to the near death. I'm not saying that at all. But when you give them 30 minutes with which to work, we're expecting something watchable. And when 27 of those minutes look like two Orange Cassidy's fighting over a remote control, there better be a damn good ending to make up for the flash from Zootopia like speed. As for that ending, well, it's what you'd expect from Shane. After surviving torturous maneuvers while somehow managing to outwrestle the dead man in spots, Shane went for the coup de grave via his patented finisher of jumping off some high crap while forming a right angle with his arm. Apparently, this is a flying elbow smash, but I've just recently binge watched some Randy Savage matches, and this is not a flying elbow smash. It's really more like a flying elbow nudge, but definitely not a smash. The one thing that did get smashed was the table, along with a conspicuous air mattress that was smooshed underneath his weight. Of course, The Undertaker was spared because he had about four minutes to get up and flee while the red-faced McMahon climbed the cage. Just one tombstone later and the farce had finally ended. A ticket selling farce it was, but a farce regardless. But hey look, a babyface win. But also a babyface loss. Actually, when you consider the ladder match, that is six matches in a row where a babyface lost. But fear not, because the next night on Raw, Spiteful Vince let Shane take over Raw for a little while anyway, because reasons. Jesus, even in the executive appointments, we get 50-50 booking. Up next is a time-wasting battle royal for a trophy depicting a man that was well, never booked in time-wasting roles. Andre was somebody a booker would heavily promote. Meanwhile, the likes of Diamond Dallas Page and Shaquille O'Neal just randomly appeared in this match, unadvertised. Hell, Tatanka just showed up into this match and wasn't even pointed out until halfway through. And what do you know? Another heel victory, as a debuting Baron Corbin earns the trophy after eliminating Kane. So now we're like four hours into the main card, six hours in overall, and there's one match left where the chosen hero is greatly disliked by the general audience. So let's just get to it. What do you mean The Rock's going to talk for 20 minutes? 2-0? Two <sighs> Heels casually bury faces, Rock shows up, Roman goes over. This is the Royal Rumble 2015 all over again. So yeah, there's like some Cowboys cheerleaders. There's a flamethrower. The Rock's here. He runs through some like labor spiel, not written on his wrist this time, and then announces the fake attendance number of nearly 102,000 people, which was legitimately about 94,000, which is still very impressive. Anyway, The Rock's just rambling now, and then out comes the Wyatt family, and they bicker for a bit about, you know, like demons and stuff, and then Bray's all like, Rocky Johnson never paid his taxes, and he was a wrestler, man. And then The Rock's all like, your dad's not really an IRS agent. And then Bray's all like, then why did he make me pay a gift on this lanterns? And all that sort of stuff. And then The Rock's like, I don't know, maybe your dad can distinguish fiction from reality anymore. And, and then Bray gets all pissed, and that leads to a fight. But instead of Bray, Rowan Everdeen volunteers as tribute and then proceeds the job to The Rock in six seconds. This is, this is The Rock's last match. If he never wrestles again, this is his last match. And it just so happens Dwayne has his wrestling gear underneath his like casual attire. Like, you know, apparently all wrestlers do. Apparently if I Sting, for instance, wears like skin makeup on top of his normal crow makeup, just in case like, I don't know, Daddy Magic jumps him in McDonald's. Also, John Cena runs in to help pantless Dwayne because he's federally mandated to appear at every WrestleMania, just a bit like Stan Lee did in all the Marvel movies. You know, you've got to send the crowd home happy after all. But did they really go home happy? It's at long last time for Triple H and Reigns for the big belt. And because it's Triple H at WrestleMania, he has to have an entrance that's way too over the top for even a Ramstein concert. In this one, Stephanie dresses as some sort of like dystopian villainess and delivers an over the top speech about Roman being our final savior, the last hope of the people. Well, tonight, hope will lose. After the fourth hour of this show, I'm pretty sure hope had already left in an Uber. 
The future short-term CEO does inform us that the crowd are blind sheep who follow and that they hang on to the empty notion of hope, which is probably the closest we'll ever get to Stephanie participating in an actual shoot interview. But honestly, it's, it's generally refreshing that she's trying to build some trust with the audience here. Despite all this rabble, the crowd is pretty well behind Triple H while booing the hell out of Roman. But you know, that can be fixed with a kick-ass brawl, one that makes Roman out to be the action hero that he's designed to play. And nothing says kick-ass quite like Roman getting his ass handed to him via textbook wrestling holds and moves. Because nothing says epic quite like Lex Luthor working Superman's arm after 20 minutes of pummeling him. The crowd doesn't wake up until Reigns accidentally spears Stephanie, but thankfully the car makes it to the fireworks factory shortly after, as Reigns spears Triple H to win the title after 27 ungodly minutes. Best I can figure is that Roman Reigns' success is somehow key to Vince assuming permanent control of WWE, so 2023 Paul Levesque went back in time Terminator style to try and make Roman look like an idiot to prevent that from happening. Hey, he even had a Terminator entrance the year previous, but that's just a theory. A wrestling theory. And cut. Or they had a crappy counterproductive match. It's either, either or. With Roman's win, seven hours of the most mentally draining WrestleMania that any of us could recall had finally ended. And the response was brutal. Readers of the Wrestling Observer newsletter voted it the worst show for all of 2016. And the WrestleCrap faithful voted WrestleMania 32 as its annual Gooker Award winner for the worst anything of 2016. Most criticism centered around the bad booking and the odd choices for match winners, the never ending length and Roman going over in the end. In other words, just about everything from WrestleMania 32 was criticized. It didn't help that the event came 48 hours after the highly praised NXT TakeOver Dallas. An increasing number of fans had been singing NXT's praises for more than two years at this point, and with that praise, the semi-regular TakeOvers were earning more love than the WWE events that they occupied the same weekend with. Even if WWE's events were decent, the consensus was it was usually, you know, I liked NXT better. And again, something the level of WrestleMania 32, well, NXT was definitely better. It's undoubted that WrestleMania 32 was behind the eight ball long before the show was held. Injuries to many marquee players, the persistent need to get the sputtering chosen face of the company over, while knowing that a record crowd would be watching. There was intense pressure on WWE's power brokers. With hindrances in place and a stubborn insistence on a specific ending, WWE tried putting its best foot forward within these parameters. And from a creative standpoint, they failed spectacularly. Everything was but a prelude to an ending that nobody wanted, and that prelude ran the gamut from insulting to tedious to displeasing to why. We've sat through long WrestleManias since, but none were as poorly assembled as 32. Every WrestleMania is built on faith, but in this case, as the chief brand officer so politely explained, hope was but an empty notion.